The Douglas TBD Devastator was an American torpedo bomber that was used by the United States Navy, ordered back in 1934. These planes often get a pretty bad rap, because by the time World War II started, they were already outdated. In a very similar case to the Brewster Buffalo, actually. They wound up being hopelessly outclassed, staining their reputation as, well, useless and just horrible. But much like the Buffalo, it's often overblown, and it's a bit unfair to the plane since when they were built in the mid-30s, they were actually very good. One of the most advanced aircraft the Navy had, actually. But aviation technology was improving at a very rapid pace at that time, and many airplanes would find themselves obsolete almost as soon as they appeared on the battlefield, as was the case with the Devastator. The prototype for the Devastator, the XTBD-1, was the winner of a U.S. Navy competition for new bombers to operate from aircraft carriers. And the prototype was ordered on June 30th, 1934, first flying on April 15th, 1935. And it actually marked several firsts for the United States Navy. It was the first all-metal naval aircraft, the first one with a completely enclosed cockpit, and the first with power-actuated folding wings. They also featured a semi-retractable landing gear, with the wheels protruding 10 inches below the wings, to potentially limit damage to the aircraft in a wheels-up landing. They had a crew of three, with the pilot in front, the rear gunner slash radio operator in the back, and the bombardier in a middle seat. During the bombing run, the bombardier would actually lay prone, sliding into position under the pilot to a sight through a window in the bottom of the fuselage, using a Norden bombsight. Their normal offensive armament would consist of either a 1,935-pound Bliss Leafit Mark 13 aerial torpedo or a 1,000-pound bomb carried semi-recess in the fuselage. Alternatively, they could carry three 500-pound general purpose bombs one under each wing, and one inside the fuselage, or 12 100-pound fragmentation bombs. For their defensive armament, they had a 7.62mm Browning machine gun for the rear gunner, and fitted to the starboard side of the cowling was either a .30 inch or a half inch M2 Browning machine gun. They were powered by an 850 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R1830-64 twin WAS radial engine. And the production run would result in several changes from the prototype, including a revised engine cowling and a raised cockpit canopy to make it easier to see. And outside of that visibility issue, the prototype did quite well. It passed its acceptance trials very easily. And when it completed its torpedo drop tests, the prototype was transferred to the Lexington for carrier certification. The extended service trials would continue until 1937, with the first two production aircraft retained by the company exclusively for further testing purposes. The U.S. Navy's Borough of Aeronautics would purchase 129 examples of the airplane, and equipped USS Saratoga, Enterprise, Lexington, Wasps, Hornet, Yorktown, and Ranger with these aircraft starting in 1937. But over the next couple of years, the Navy was becoming aware that the Devastator wasn't exactly great anymore. Technology, again, had advanced very rapidly, so even before World War II started, they knew the Devastator was obsolete and would be outclassed in an actual war situation. But they didn't have a replacement. The Grumman TBF Avenger was in the works, but they weren't ready yet. So they had to stick with the Devastator. And though they transferred some for training duties, they still had over 100 aircraft when the United States finally entered World War II. While they were obsolete, in the early days, the Devastators were actually alright, for the purposes they were using them for, anyway. During February and March of 1942, the TBDs sent from Enterprise in Yorktown to attack targets in the Marshall and Gilbert Islands, as well as Wake and Marcus Islands, while more TBDs, also from Yorktown and Lexington, struck Japanese shipping off of New Guinea, they did okay. In fact, in the Battle of the Coral Sea, Devastators helped sink the Japanese aircraft carrier Shoho on May 7th. But they did fail to hit another carrier, 
the Shokaku the following day. But overall, at that point, given the fact that they were obsolete, they were doing a fine job. Not overwhelmingly so, but they were doing fine enough. And the part of the problem with the Devastators wasn't even their fault at all. There were faults with the Mark 13 torpedoes they were using. Many would actually hit their targets, but didn't actually detonate. Which was kind of at least half of the equation. And it makes the Devastator couldn't do their job even when they did hit their targets. They also had a tendency to run deeper than the set depth, which caused them to go underneath targets and miss completely again. Also, not the Devastator's fault, and it took over a year for the defects to be fixed. In fact, they were not fixed at all by June 4th, 1942, during the Battle of Midway. This is what the Devastators are infamous for, as this was a bad, bad situation for them. A total of 41 Devastators would be launched from USS Hornet, Enterprise, and Yorktown to attack the Japanese fleet. But for one thing, the sorties weren't well coordinated. Rear Admiral Raymond A. Spruance had ordered a strike on the enemy carriers immediately after they were discovered. Rather than taking the time to coordinate an attack that involved different types of aircraft, like fighters, bombers, and torpedo planes. And the TBDs from Hornet and Enterprise did have an escort, but they would lose contact with them. So they had to start their attacks without any kind of fighter protection. And this meant that they were sitting ducks. The Devastators were never very fast. Their maximum speed was a little over 200 miles per hour, and their cruising speed was only 128. They also weren't very maneuverable in any real way, and they really couldn't maneuver when they were in their bombing runs because they had to fly straight and level to actually launch the torpedo properly. Oh, yeah, they didn't really have very good armor for the Sims at the time either. And in order to launch the torpedo, not only did they have to fly straight and level, but they couldn't do it unless they were flying below 115 miles per hour, even slower than their cruising speed. They were picked apart by planes like the Mitsubishi A6M Zeros. Only four TBDs would make it back to Enterprise, none to Hornet, and only two to Yorktown, without scoring a single torpedo hit. But this seemingly pointless slaughter of American pilots was not completely without benefits for the battle. Several of the TBDs did manage to get close to the targets and drop their torpedoes, and thus be able to both strafe the enemy ships and force the Japanese carriers to take evasive maneuvers. This caused the Japanese to keep their flight decks clear and continually reinforce their combat air patrols, rather than launch any counterattacks against American carriers, which is actually what Spruance had predicted they would do. This opened another window of opportunity for the Douglas SBD Dauntless Dive Bombers to take over, and they would wind up winning the day for the American side. Even though the Devastator attack had been a disaster, the Battle of Midway would be a victory for the Allies. But it was obvious, quite clearly, that the Devastators really should not be used in battle anymore. They were just too slow and vulnerable. The Navy immediately withdrew the 39 remaining TBDs that were still in the frontline service after Midway, and some of the surviving Devastators did remain in service briefly in the Atlantic and in training squadrons until 1944. By that point, not a single one would remain in the U.S. Navy's inventory. The original prototype actually finished her career at NAS Norman, Oklahoma, and the last TBD in the U.S. Navy was used by the commander of the Fleet Air Activities West Coast. When his was scrapped in November of 1944, there wasn't a single example of this plane left. None survived. And again, in the Devastator's defense, in truth, particularly in 1942, the better TBF Avengers didn't perform that well either. One of the big problems at Midway is just that that particular type of aircraft, torpedo bombers in general, were incredibly vulnerable to the Japanese defenses. And you could have sent pretty much any kind of bomber out with no fighter cover and they would have gotten slaughtered in the same way. It took growing American air superiority, as well as coordination, and more experienced pilots before they could actually successfully accomplish their roles in subsequent battles. The Devastators probably would never have been able to do that because, again, they were obsolete, 
but that wasn't their entire issue, and they were never really bad planes. Not at all, they were actually quite good for their day, but their day just didn't last very long. And while none actually exist in preservation, interestingly, there are a few underwater that are known to exist. There's actually been a proposal to recover several from the wreck of Lexington. Other examples that have been found exist in varying degrees of, well, intactness. It really depends on where they went down, how badly damaged before they crashed, how hard they crashed, etc, etc. But the recovery plan is still in motion for some of these aircraft as of January of 2023. So the verdict's still out if we'll ever recover a complete Devastator, though there is a full-scale one-to-one replica in existence that was utilized for the recent movie, Midway. After the film was done, Lionsgate, instead of getting rid of it, opted to donate the replica, and she'll be displayed on board, appropriately, USS Midway who serves as a museum ship to this very day. In terms of my opinion of the Devastators, I'd say they're overhated. They don't get enough credit for what they did, or what they tried to do. If they had been built and developed during World War II, I'd say, yeah, they were pretty bad. But they weren't. They were produced in the 30s, and they flew like planes from the 30s. That was really their problem. But their biggest embarrassment actually didn't have much to do with their inadequacies. I mean, that was part of it, but it was also how they were deployed, as well as utilizing torpedoes that, frankly, were nearly useless. None of that was really their fault. Maybe someday we'll actually get an original up from the depths of the Pacific, so it could be put in a museum, where I do think at least one example should be. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131-232, and Zach A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Brian, Jack Carson's Rara Videos, Lord Off444, Mark Holding, Murder Drone Stall, A Person 723, Royal Oz 2060, Icefer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Ohio Trucker 1, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Hayton DeGrow, Caleb Rainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Arizona Hot Rail, Liam Wright, Mr. Sleepy, Travis Delinsky, Jared Brussel, Dr. Racer 78, Joshua Long, Hannah Bird, and Andrak 2024 Productions. Till next time, this is Darkness, and a bit well a fun farewell.